uh, being. <laughs> okay, y'all. One more time. We're gonna try. Hi there. We're gonna be going live momentarily, hopefully. We've been having some technical difficulties, but now I'm on a new device and I'm hoping that that um, helps solve the problem. So now I'm just trying to get Keith back in here. Um, let's see if that happens. Um, I keep sending him things, but I don't know if he realizes that I'm back on on the live um but i'm just gonna keep waiting um for keith to join um and hopefully he will show up um i'm gonna email him because i don't wanna now i can't text him because i'm in the chat let's see Dun, da, da. There we go. He's active. We have an active Keith. He's joined. Yes. Yes. Go live. Da, da, da. We're waiting for Keith. And now what? I don't know. Well, now I'm on a, a more modern piece of technology by a couple years. And so maybe that was the problem. I don't know. Wow. Do I... It's so clear and lucid now. Oh, so maybe this is it. I've solved the problem. No more Instagram live from the iPad, only the iPhone. <laughs> um, well, for anybody so was... who has been following us through this process, Welcome back to Checking In with Keith Hennessy. <laughs> We've uh, been, it's been experiments in technology thus far. Um, but I want to hear what you were trying to tell us. You were about to tell us about something that sounded interesting. <laughs> well, I was saying that there's been an explosion of online sex since mm. COVID. Um, I would say it kicked in really sometime in, well, by late March, there were already events happening and by April it was off the hook global. Um, <laughs> and I first got activated through a kind of like almost new age gay men's sex and intimacy kind of network that's linked mm -hmm. to um, Stretch Festival in Berlin and Ignite Festival in Vancouver. Um, these kind of events where um, you could be in, you know, naked yoga class or dance class or um, all the way into different events that are body work oriented to like jerk off rituals with 70 people, you know. <laughs> um, that would be in the live events that have been happening for the last few years. But what happened okay. is that when, when COVID kicked off, all kinds of people started offering online events. So like by March 21st, I did the global equinox jerk off. Um, <laughs> and that was probably only 30 men. And then within weeks, it was like any event had hundreds. Wow. Um, and then a site, a, a gay tantra site took off. And that became this amazing, it was very different from a sex app because you could go on and take classes, mm. um, breath work, meditation, uh, tuning your chakras into your sexuality, some of the very, very worst of cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. um, misreading of, you know, histories of yoga and Tantra to actually very principled and ethical kind of classes that were no. really dealing with the politics of sex shame and what it means to um, come together and to add breath and movement to your, you know, your sensation based life. It's like these and in all of these communities in multiple countries, there are dancers and people that I know from the contemporary dance world 
who are bringing their somatic practices, yeah. their improv and awareness practices and body tuning practices into this world of sex and sexuality. So in the early parts of COVID, I got pretty involved in this world. And mm. through these sites, you also then connect with individual people. And then you basically create Zoom and FaceTime events to chat, hang out and have sex together wow. online. Yeah. So it's been, a, and where it's interesting for me has been to think about what is shared body space through technology? Mm. How do we become aware of each other? Um, how is this implicated in the dancer audience relationship or the dancer to dancer relationship with teaching? Um, some people, of course, jumped right into dance teaching. I couldn't feel it. And I turned down the first few offers that I had to do it. You mean doing virtual dance teaching? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I took yoga classes more in the early part than now. Now I'm down to sort of like one class a week. Okay. Um, and I really hesitated to teach. Um, I did teach at Holland's University as part of their uh, summer MFA. So I did two three week sessions. Oh, wow. And um, I'd say the first three weeks happened really during the moment of the uprising, right? When, mm. when COVID, I would call this phase two of COVID, right? right. When, when Black Lives Matter reignites, takes off in this extraordinary way, and, um, and at a scale that we had not seen previously yeah. um, in terms of responses to police violence, yeah. um, which is, of course, a historic movement that's been going on for hundreds of years in this country and has had many waves of, of intensity and organizing and the ways that that shifts or does not shift public discourse and public policy. But this one just seemed really different. And um, teaching at Hollands where the majority of the students are black and Latinx, mm. where, um, where we still were not completely ruined by the number of Zoom meetings that we've had to schedule um, and where they were starting their summer school on Zoom. But I felt like within two months, the number of students in burnout from doing classes online, from realizing that the, you know, the annual artist talk that they would give as part of their graduation uh, was happening on Zoom, that their final performances were, were videos, um, that their dance classes had been turned into, including with me, mentored studio practices, which really were mostly about the discussions about practice rather than the practice itself. And I felt like we started to lose the possibility of what could happen in the exchange through technology. Um, mm. You know, I was, I was trying to experiment I think that there's something really deadly about this focus on the frontal and the focus on the face um, that is happening. And I know there are some people doing some very uh, good experiments with Zoom teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I would say mine were fairly basic, but for a while I was doing a thing where you just leave your arm in the frame. Okay. And then if someone else's arm is in the frame, you could start with copying and then you could start to dance with each other mm. uh, and, pull, and pull your face out. Yeah. And so that there was just a different kind of looking. Sure. And then I switched to only dancing with your back to the camera. Mm. So we were moving more into almost an authentic movement kind of practice. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, that's authentic movement trademark. It's a, it's a practice of witnessing someone dancing. And so, it was more like the idea of a witness and a dancer um, so that the dancer could take their focus away from this right. energy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there's something about the Zoom body that needs to be, wow, Cody Harrell just jumped on here. <laughs> this is amazing. This is the crazy thing about the internets um, <laughs> is that suddenly you're talking to people that you haven't seen in five years or 10 years. <laughs> the combination of COVID and internet. But yeah, yeah, what I was trying to talk about is that the Zoom body or even this, this video streaming body um, has some built-in dangers, right? There's already 
people studying the health impacts of it, how, why it contributes to fatigue much faster. Mm. Um, but what I'm calling the Zoom body is, right, it's a frontal facing, it's face dominant. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the several projects that I'm trying to work on uh, that I really find hard to work on online projects, but Constance Hockaday, Connie Hockaday is working on an amazing project right now. And um, she invited me to uh, write a kind of presidential speech leading into the elections. And uh, she's asking many, many artists to do it. And yeah. one of the challenges has been me thinking through what, like, what do we actually need politically? And I started thinking, well, what we need is to not look directly at problems. We need to be mm. pulling from the peripheries. We need to be working intuitively and somatically. And all of these things I realized are resistance to what I'm calling the Zoom body, this frontal facing, direct gaze, face mm. dominant body. Um, so yeah, somewhere between the online sex and the rethinking through Zoom teaching, I've been trying to sort of like reactivate, um, I don't know, a kind of shame-free body-based person-to-person communication world and investigate it. So that's been a bunch of my COVID timing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that sounds um, really complex and rich and um, yeah, just interesting. Like I'm thinking about like what, it, what, what has, um, Gosh, the the online sex community brought you know what like are there things that uh, were brought to light in in um, the shaping and or crafting of those experiences that have like informed um, a, 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 a somatic like a, a somatic teaching process or something or um, vice yeah. versa or you know how that well definitely participating in this kind of like um, shame like a space where, because one of the problems with the Tantra community, whether it's gay or straight, right, is the, the vast majority of people involved um, think of politics or activism as really distracting and or um, insignificant projects compared to the project of their self contentment and their self healing, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're universalist spaces, they're liberal spaces in the worst kind of ways, yeah. um, right? Where, yeah. where race doesn't exist, even though it's obvious that we're in a white majority space. Sure. Race doesn't exist and colonialism never existed, even though white people are teaching things and naming it Tantra and Buddhism and other things. Mm. Um, not to mention that the Tantra that's happening in most Tantra spaces literally has nothing to do with the history of Tantra. Sure. Um, and I would, you know, I'm one of like two people on a site of 4,000 who will every now and then remind people <laughs> that A, Osho, formerly just known as Rajneesh, uh, but like that Osho, one, is a convicted criminal, sex abuser, and uh, attempted murderer, just by the way. <laughs> but also, what's kind of amazing about Osho in his work is that he brought together all of this Western psychological stuff. He got very into Freud and from Freud to Reich. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about Reich, well, Wilhelm Reich, is all the somatic um, sex positive practices that he developed, even if they, like most people of that era, uh, these practices were not so awesome for gays or even for women, but, um, you know, Wilhelm Reich is an early sexual liberationist and that mm -hmm. fully impacted this post hippie community of the sannyasins, of the Rajneesh world, of the Osho world. And so when people say, like I literally took a Tantra workshop where the teacher was referring to the 5,000 year history of, of the exercises we were doing. Mm. And then the next exercise he introduced was from Osho and it was a shaking exercise. And it was an exercise that anyone who has worked with me and hundreds of other dancers in the last 10 years, um, especially the Meg Stewart's uh, and the people who have, you know, come out of her lineage, if we can call that a lineage, but people who are doing like intense shaking or um, 
even a lot of the trauma release work now uses shaking. So here we were shaking and half the class was like, this is a 5,000 year old Tantra practice when really it's an Osho practice coming out of this merger of East West sort of post-racial universalist colonialist practices of Esalen and California in the seventies. Um, So I don't know, there's, that's a distraction of the Tantra world, but there's, there's something about thinking through bodies and coming from desire that Mm -hmm. I felt like starts to get pushed aside in some of our, um, I don't know, for me as a white man working in a politically activated or a politically charged art world where my work is in quotes, social justice or socially engaged work for the last 30 years. um, I come into performance through um, the work of liberating my own body also, right? Like this early queer body, this trying to figure out what my small town gay body is doing in the big city and what sexual liberation would really look like. And that the processes that I went through to do that became uh, embodied in my aesthetics and in my community building and how I built work in my art world. And then it's like my performance work also comes, emerges from within the context of the AIDS pandemic, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's something very, again, the politics, a, a gay male sexual politics is actually at a place where that's, it's radical to discuss, it's radical to uh, represent on stage. Um, and it's radical in the sense of it being a major intervention in dominant practices. Right. And now I'm a 60 year old white cis man is what I am. And the gay is almost like this side story. And if mm-hmm. I even front my gay story, it's almost like, I'm fucking up with what's really happening with queer and QPOC and BIPOC communities by trying to center like a white gay male story. Right. Right. So that makes it harder for me to think back to like, well, I still have only my body as a core material to start with. Right. So, and my body is still a horny gay male body. Right. Like I still fetishize men. Um, What activates my, you know, like my cock heart connection, you know, like those things are still real and, yeah. and they activate what we bring to a dance space, what we bring to a dance body. Mm. Um, and there's something about the, the sheltering in place, the force not collaborating with anybody. Mm. Um, so then it's me alone in my house. So then it's like, well, then what would I do? And the online Tantra world is definitely better than shitty porn. <laughs> so then, I start to think, okay, I want to come back into dancing and performance. Mm. And instantly the first two projects that I did, I just was like, I only want to be fully naked (laughs) um, and touching people. Mm. So I looked for people who were willing to pod with me. Oh wow! And um, I did a lot of dancing on a beach. I think I shared some photos with you from the project with Nathaniel Moore, where we would go to this sort of remote section of a beach in Half Moon Bay and just be naked. And at first we would just pass the camera back and forth, right? Like I would dance, he would dance, we were naked, we would hump the sand, we would throw ourselves into the ocean yeah. and improvise. That's and then we, de- we decided we could start touching. Okay. So then we started touching and that meant inviting people to photograph us or video us. Mm. And these became real time live performance Okay. Because people are walking by watching naked men touching each other, being photographed. And the being photographed um, indicates that it's an art event, Mm -hmm. right? So an audience can actually now watch and not be like, this is too intimate or this is too weird. Sure. There's permission. And it's California. So yes, people could walk by and even families could walk by. But nudity on the beach is not completely foreign. It's still Northern California. Sure. Um, and then I was invited to a project uh, to create work online for a kind of international symposium. And we were right in the uprising. And I was like, it doesn't make sense. This project with Nathaniel is kind of this liberated space where we're not thinking about audience or funding. We didn't write a grant for this. We can do anything we want. What if we just yeah. follow pleasure? And then when it was go- taking that work into an international forum, I was like, 
no, not right now. That doesn't make sense. Even though it's working for me in terms of thinking through my practice, like how do we activate online spaces and what is the role of my body and my pleasure and my healing to that space, right? Yeah. And so then Brontes Purnell had been sending me naked videos and I was like, hey, Brontes, um, do you wanna get naked? Maybe we invite Nathaniel and we'll w make something for this event. And Brontes had been working in his backyard. So the three of us went to his backyard and we set up cameras. So there was no camera person. Mm. We just set up phones on tripods. Sure. And all I did was propose the opening gesture, which is we're fully naked from the get go with maybe some fun costume bits on us, but we're sure. basically naked. Yeah. And the opening five minutes is we smear each other and massage coconut oil all over each other for five minutes. Okay. And then it's what, then it's whatever happens for the next hour. Wow. And we've given the material to two different video artists, um, both oh. Chani Bachwinkle in, uh, in the Bay Area and Xavier Hamel in um, LA. And they made two completely different works from the sure. material. Wow. Um, which I'd love to share, but again, it's weird of like, where do you share full frontal nudity online? Suddenly it has to be password protected or such and such. Yeah. Um, but we made these videos and there's a definitely a direct relationship between the dancing, performing body explorations I'm doing with these artists in real time and having reactivated a certain kind of body and desire through participating in online sex contexts because sure. of COVID. Yeah. So there's something in that conversation that's really interesting. And I also think just there's, I mean, there's so much tension right now, um, I think everywhere, but yeah. um, we're in a particular crisis in the local Bay Area with um, an artist who has accused a choreographer of sexual abuse in the rehearsal pr process. Mm. And, um, and for sure, I think that the COVID reality is blowing up the drama even further. Okay. Um, but I think that there's just increasing fears around how do bodies interact with each other? How do we have white and non-white bodies collaborating with each other in this political climate? How do we have older and younger bodies collaborate with each other yeah. in, a, in a climate where people's triggers and consciousness about power and, and power abuse is so activated? Sure. One of, one of the things that's done in recent years has really pulled me back to the duet practice. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm still doing group work, but I've centered a lot of work around the duet where it's like, can we have a conversation where we understand what mutuality and consent is? Sure. Um, because as soon as we enter the director on the group or even the right. group collaborative space, the question and especially because with my work, a lot of that means cross racial spaces, queer and trans spaces, yeah. where there's a lot of activation and attention to issues of power abuse and the potentials for violence. Um, if you reduce the collaborating body to a duo, there's more time for the kinds of conversations you need to have right. um, about power and the potential for, for harm. Right. Um, so yeah, that's some of the ways I'm thinking about Art, COVID, power, sex, race, you know, the topics, gender, yeah. money, yeah. class. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. This was your introduction. Is that what we're still on theoretically yeah. 47 <laughs> minutes in? But No, that was, um, that was COVID. Yeah, right. That was COVID. Um, wow. That's so much. I'm impressed yeah. with your capacity to... Um, like have worked through all that. It feels like um, you've been in some productive space. Um, uh, I don't know, yeah, I, mean, I guess it's been six months, but. <laughs> I feel quite activated. Yeah, um, that's refreshing. I'll just say, I'll tell you how gay I am. I, <laughs> I picked this filter thinking it was just about rainbow colors and that it was a cool technology. Yeah. But then I just clicked it and it told me that this is the pride feature. Oh, right. I forgot that rainbow equals gay. I sometimes. Oh, how could you forget even? I don't know. 
<laughs> That's great. Um, I want to I wanna ask you about, ooh, how did it, it just did a little, hey, uh, a, nice, a nice little effect. Um, I want to ask you about um, maybe an old school project. I don't know if old school, old school. I Well, I've heard through the grapevine that you're going to work on something with Ishmael or, or something's happening with Ishmael Houston Jones, who's a mutual friend of ours and a uh, choreographer and writer and um, many other things. Um, and I just kind of want to know about that. And I'm wondering if you can talk about it at all. Yeah. Um, for a variety of reasons and happenstances, I feel like almost created by other people, Ishmael and I started working together intermittently over the last few years. Yeah. So what happened first was when Ishmael and I think Will Rawls were doing this large platform at Dance Space around um, the impact of AIDS on dance and looking at this history. Um, Claudia LaRocco, who used to be in New York, but who's now connected with the Museum of Modern Art here, decided to do a kind of sister event in the Bay Area. And she hooked Ishmael and I up knowing that we had a history. And that was, I think, 2016 um, was when that platform happened. But mm -hmm. then little things have continued to happen. So then last year, Meg Stewart held a massive event in Germany. Right. And she invited Ishmael and I to do something together because it was like, we have this improv history, we have this relationship, what will they do together? And Ish and I had this really positive experience and we activated a number of dynamics and uh, including them, we were invited. Tommy DeFrance saw the two of us working together. So then Tommy DeFrance invited us into the platform he was working on within the Meg Stewart organized event. And um, I'm not sure, I think Ishmael is a, I mean, we all know he's a very special person for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the things that's possible when Ish and I improvise together or work together is that there's a kind of fearlessness about going into a space where the ways that our bodies are racially marked and the histories, like the racialized histories that we bring to the moment when our bodies collide with each other is just allowed to be very present. And it's personal, like, yes, I'm white and yes, Ishmael's black and the potential for power and violence are very tangible. Um, but we're also allowed to both name it and go into the space. Like mm -hmm. some things that would not be possible in a, in a lot of other collaborations that I do. Sure. Um, and so then, you know, Joy Smith, who's an African-American um, genderqueer thinker, performer, uh, educator, who now works at SNDO, invited us Ishmael and I to co-teach at SNDO last January. Um, so that was one of my last travels of this year. Uh -huh. um, I was in, right, we were at SNDO in January and then I toured Canada in February and that was the mm -hmm. end of, that was the end of my career as I formerly knew it. <laughs> um, but when Ishmael and I were working together in January, we were invited to teach um, a week long class on sort of investigating whiteness. Mm. And, its, and its impact in dance. And through all of these um, events of the last four years, the intersections of like, of racial politics and queer politics with the dancing body, with what improvisation is, with what can be a, a sort of somatic or body-based discourse space outside of like the standard obedient practices of linguistic driven activism, right? Or language based activism. Somewhere in there I went, hey, it's grant writing season. Um, wow, it's Alicia, I think just joined. Um, somewhere in that moment, Ishmael and I looked at each other and I was like, hey, it's grant writing season. I'm gonna write to make a new piece. Do you want to make a new work with me? Uh, but with actual funding rather than like all of these pickup gigs that other people are driving. Right. And we wrote a series of grants. My, um, my admin colleague, collaborator, Ali Wild and I uh, wrote a series of grants. And you know how grant writing goes. You're an expert. You don't know. Are you, you gonna get one grant for yeah. $8,000 or are you gonna get a whole bunch of money? 
Yeah. And something crazy happened, which is there was a grant for 150,000. And oh, wow. I've never gotten a grant bigger than say $35,000 before. So we wrote this grant for Ishmael to choreograph a work for five people that included me. So we would enter a collaborative relationship, but I wouldn't direct the work. Um, and we got the $150,000 grant. Okay. And then we got a bunch of other grants. Ooh. So suddenly, like we had over $200,000 to make a work. Oh, wow. And then it's back to John Z is joined. So <laughs> then we had, what for me is a massive amount of money to make a work and now we're in COVID. So there is going to be a work. Okay. There's going to be some kind of process mm -hmm. and the, the dancer collaborators in the work were invited sort of to create a, a multi-generational span of queer artists. Okay. And uh, everyone in the core group is from the Bay Area. So Jose Abad, um, Snowflake Towers, AKA Danielle Arismendi, okay. um, who's a two-spirit indigenous artist of Yoeme and Mayan descent, um, and Kevin O'Connor. Uh, Kevin O'Connor, like me, is a white Canadian, um, okay. but a lot of Kevin's research and work is um, at the intersections of ecological work and collaborations with indigenous people. Mm. Um, and just Kevin is just a really extraordinary person. He's right now he's obsessed with fascia. Um, so his study of fascia and his working through fascia in, as a somatic practice is very influenced by his thinking of, of colonialism, the white body, um, uh, race and power and class. So Kevin's on the project. Jose Abad is a really amazing uh, younger dancer choreographer but he, there's something more about them um because they're in this generation that they're curators but they're also organizers of certain kind of spaces so jose is quite central to a lot of the emerging uh creative networks of qpoc artists and dance artists in the bay area um, jose is um a filipino and caribbean black descent and um works with a number of choreographers in the Bay Area and has been part of two or three of my projects previously. Cool. And Snowflake Towers is an artist who um, I've been working with for almost two years now. And we did a series of projects um, called Circle X. We did Winter Circle X and Spring Circle X. And these were, we decided to sort of break theatrical modes and do these six hour events uh, where food is served all day long during okay. the event. Uh, the days began with indigenous talking circles where only indigenous people spoke. Um, and then they would decide when to invite non-indigenous people into it. And I'm saying indigenous, but I also mean Native Americans, indigenous people of this continent. Um, and then the middle part of the day was what I called a political healing clinic, mm -hmm. where we invited, curated, hired healers in all kinds of different modalities to offer healings from political harm. Mm. So that could be body work, it could be sound healing, it could be uh, craniosacral, it could be, you know, witchcraft, it could be um, indigenous uh, healings, limpia. Mm. Um, so you came into a room and you could imagine it as an installation and you could just witness healings mm. happening all around the room or you okay. could go and sit near anybody and they would pull you in and do healings for you. Wow. Um, and then the third part of the day, uh, the last two hours moved into what we more traditionally think of as a performance. And there was a punk band, a local punk band and five dancers mm. with Snowflake and I sort of present, sometimes engaging, mostly I was out of it by this point because okay. the band and all the other dancers were non-white. So um, we would start the day with Snowflake and I just doing a duet together dancing in, the, in an empty hall. We didn't oh, use wow. a theater space okay. um, as people arrived. And then the last part of the day was this uh, sort of improvised dance music event with a screaming punk band and um, dancers. Wow. So 
Snowflake and I have, you know, some history in creating events. And now Ishmael is going to lead, but AKA not lead. Because uh, as Ishmael <laughs> says that a lot of uh, Ishmael's leading practice is, um, um, is leading by not leading in a way, like yeah. setting up contexts for people to uh, imagine and expand their own boundaries and their own relationships. And right. um, so we'll see how, we'll see where that goes and how. Yeah. But yeah, so, so Ishmael and I, like in a way I'm the producer, instigator of the project. Ishmael's right. the choreographer. Okay. Everyone's a key collaborator. Um, we invited Swoon, AKA Caledonia mm. Curry to do visuals for the project. Okay. Um, and all we know is that we're meeting every few weeks on Zoom to talk and have things emerge. And when we can be live, we will um, figure out how to be in the same place. And we're not committed to producing an event for a theater, but we are definitely producing uh, work to be experienced by people. Mm. Yeah. And do you, an do you anticipate that that is a, is a San Francisco thing? Is this something that um, might live in more places than just San Francisco? Or do you even- We, ima even we, imagined, it as a, we imagined it as a tourable event. Like um, I think everyone yeah. in it is down with touring, wants it to tour. And at sure. the same time, we're in this like, what is touring? What, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, I don't really see that group of people super focused on producing video art, but maybe over the next three or four months, what we realize is we need to bring a video collaborator in who does think sure. through the moving image, does think through um, the current streaming technologies and right. we start to think through that. Sure. So I don't, I don't, without that person, I don't think that we're gonna put our focus in producing videos. Yeah. But I, there's a vision to produce, um, and also we've always been slow working artists. I've known Ishmael for 25 years. So, um, and what if it doesn't tour until three years from now? That's also interesting. Ish will be seven, will be in his early seventies. Oh my God. Um, I know. Is it only 25 years? That, that feels like a short time for you and Ish to know each other. When you said that, I was like, it's 2020. Like, did you only Well, you know what's 95? weird is that in the 80s, we didn't know each other. Mm. So I'm not sure quite how that happened. Um, I was in New York in the 80s, of course, but really at the very punk and anarchist edges of scenes. Okay. Um, Tim Miller was kind of like the ultimate um, brother cousin networker of gay male performers. Yeah. Um, and I didn't meet Tim Miller till probably 89. Okay. Um, and then, you know, more West Coast focused and Ish was rarely on the West Coast. West Coast. Right. So we didn't get together till just before what we called the uh, the development of protease inhibitors, but you know, antiviral therapies for HIV. Wow. Um, we got together at the very, like, I don't know, 94. We were brought together by Patrick Scully of Minneapolis. And oh. we, did a, we did a trio work called Unsafe Unsuited. Right. And so that was the first time that you guys got to know each other. Yeah, that's when we really got to know each other. Huh, okay. So I, I think realize. that is 25 years ago. Yeah, wow. 25, 26. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's, um, it's been, I'm trying to think, we've, we've spent a lot of time. And so in some ways I'm thinking we should wrap up, but I'm trying to look at my questions and see if there's uh, any other things um, that we want to share. Are there thing, is there anything else that you want to share or say or? Um, what's interesting? I don't know. I have no idea if people are actually listening to us, um, but maybe somebody else has a question. Do people um, have questions? Are people here? I don't know. <laughs> Who's listening? Listening? It says that there's some people there, but I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, people tend to come in and out in these yeah, things. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. Did I generate all these hearts going up and down the space or did somebody else generate um, hearts? I think that, that the people, oh no, the hearts in your face are from you. Cody's there. Hi, Cody. Um, What's going on, Cody? 
What should we talk <laughs> about? Who's Cody? I don't know if I know Cody. And who's à tout à l'heure? Je ne sais pas. Quelqu'un qui parle français in Stockholm. In Stockholm. Wait, what? It's Tove. Um, yeah, what to talk about? I mean, it's so strange, this thing to miss travel and at the same time, yes, Tove, I know it's you. I love you. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, like, I mean, thinking of Tove is also a good example, right? Because it's like, we know each other through international travel. Yeah. They're in Stockholm. I'm in San Francisco. We meet each other at Ponderosa in Germany. We, mm -hmm. we have shaken together in, you know, in their shaking project um, where they get a whole audience shaking with them and um, activating their, you know, their full energy systems. Um, but even before COVID, um, Tova was part of this you know, network of artists who are saying, maybe we need to focus more locally. Maybe we need to get in fewer planes. Maybe yeah. we need to actually think about the climate crisis in a different way. So yeah. that was already going, right, before COVID. So yeah. there's something about reinvesting in the local. Like, you know, when I first got, um, you know, became a part of this housing co-op and now it's like, I'm not a homeowner, but I'm like a homeowner, meaning that I have mm -hmm. to care about the building. Right. And all of a sudden you have a different relationship to hosting homeless people on your stoop or someone shitting in front of your building mm -hmm. and then thinking, what does it mean to clean that up? And I thought, wow, my relationship to um, the housing crisis has really shifted now that I have protected housing, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I did was I was like, you know what, I always blame that I don't do a certain kind of local volunteer work on the fact that I'm always touring. Mm -hmm. And I decided I would just shift that. So three years ago, I started uh, volunteering every single Friday that I'm not on the road, which is at least six months of the year and sometimes eight and nine months of the year. Every Friday, I work in a soup kitchen and mm -hmm. I chop vegetables to make the soup and I serve the donated bread from all the bakeries and the stores. And, um, and I think about this sort of contraction to the local and what that does to these international friendships, relationships, collaborations that are super mutually inspiring and yeah. what happens to them, right? Like, um, do you then make a point out of like trying to call people once a month? And it's like, I'm kind of a who's in front of me is who's in front of me kind of person. Sure. Like, even you and me, Ben, it's like, I care about you, but we yeah, don't I call it, we're not no. on each other's weekly call list, you know, no. like, um, and that's okay. Like we're out in the world, we're doing our thing. So yeah. I'm, I'm finding it quite interesting to think about this instant global access, all information possible. We're in an ecological crisis. The ecological crisis is of course connected and is related to um, the current pandemic, but also um, disease vectors and and public health in general, right? So yeah. like an, an ecological crisis is a racial crisis, is a public health crisis, always has been, right. is a refugee crisis, right? And so, yeah, what are we going to do about our, like the international travel part of our solidarity and mutual inspiration? Like how will we continue to mutually inspire each other? Those right. of us whose lives are based on literally body to body exchange, like Mm. I don't just have a witnessing experience with Tove in Stockholm. We have an actual body experience being together, like, yeah. like touching each other, hugging each other, dancing together in embodied spaces together. So um, I am somewhat concerned about what that means, what it, what it means to reactivate those things on local levels, um, what it means to lose those things on international levels. Um, I think for quite a while we were thinking about what we would do after COVID. And even though people were saying, oh, don't go back to normal, normal was never good anyway. Um, there is something about like imagining a post COVID reality, but what has happened with the project with Ishmael Houston Jones and others 
is we've had to look at each other and say, we're no longer thinking about the piece as post COVID. We're now going to make a piece during COVID. We're going to make a piece impacted by COVID. And, you know, of course, Ishmael and I who meet as part of the extremely culturally generative era of the first 20 years of AIDS is like, what is it to make work sort of spanning from one pandemic to another? And then what is it to work with people, uh, with other queers and gay men and people who uh, in former eras of gay sexuality might have been referred to as gay men, but are now non-binary, trans, two-spirit. Um, how do we speak from one pandemic to the next pandemic? And what, mm -hmm. what will be the experiences of this time? Like, this, this will be COVID era work. We'll, the, the work will be shaped by and uh, impacted by this moment. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I just, I have to, I know I keep talking, but I want, I can see in my frame that there's a photo. Uh, in, I can see that there's a, you can see a painting up above my head. Yes. So I just wanted to give a shout out because that's, um, for my 60th birthday, a lot of people drew or painted uh, portraits of me. And that is a painting of me by Annie Sprinkle. Oh, lovely. Thanks, Annie. Yeah. Wait, which Amanda just joined? Is that Amanda Pina or somebody else? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. Um, well, I'm going to have to run on to the next uh, virtual situation, unfortunately. Yes, that's what we do. Um, but it's been lovely to uh, catch up with you and connect. Um, can you tell people how they can, obviously, I mean, I imagine we can follow your Instagram, but... Um, do you have a mailing list? Can people find out more about your work somewhere? Yeah, I am pretty shitty on the regular updates. And right now, no posts. Um, both of them have turned into a snake pit of um, harm and hurt and accusation and defense uh, in my immediate dance community. So I've been kind of just avoiding it. But um, I do have a website. And the website is, if you look for Keith Hennessy, or my company is called Circo Zero, C-I-R-C-O-Z-E-R-O. -E um, you can find things that are going on. And the project with Brontes and Brontes Purnell and Nathaniel Moore is not yet up on my website. But I am trying to figure out what is the way that you can post videos, but then do some kind of like age screening. So we're not accused of just right. blasting penis in front of everybody because I know right. not everyone wants men's men's genitals in their face. Yeah. So, um, so, so I haven't put much of the COVID based work online yet, but I will be in the next month or two. Okay. And, and what about your national address? How can we find out about that? Cause I've been, I've been following, or I know about the national addresses because of Christina Wong's work with Rachel Dolezal. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you've caught those, Christina. No, I want to see it. Christina has been commissioning, I think Christina and Constance both have been commissioning Rachel Dolezal via Cameo. I don't know if you know this, the Cameo is some like app or something where you can like pay celebrities to make like happy birthday videos or something for your friends. Wow. And so like celebrities put themselves on cameo and it's like you know $35 or it's $500 or whatever but apparently Rachel Dolezal is there and so Christina has discovered this and is now using Rachel to deliver messages of encouragement to um, some of her fellow uh, <laughs> uh, I guess national address folks i.e. Brontes and I forget there was another one th that I saw the other day but I can't remember who that one was for. I <laughs> saw Brontes do a thing that was uh, being interviewed as the president right uh that brontes has put up on his instagram constance's yes. project i think is running through ucla but i can't tell you because i've been so bad at responding to emails and i'm late sure. in finishing my address but that okay. for sure uh when that goes up i will also put that um out in the on my website and i'll put that out okay. into the world okay super um yeah well, no, my emphasis you. right now is still 
I'll just say my emphasis right now has still been really on live events. Like even if no one's there, like I made a dance in my backyard with a nine year old. I'm on the mm. beach dancing. I'm in Brontes's backyard dancing. Anyone yeah. who will meet me, I'm going camping every two weeks and doing naked photo shoots on the Yuba River. Like I'm outdoors, outdoors all the time. That's where to find me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm probably producing some outdoor work um, co-curated with um, Ryan Austin Dennis, um, who's a black curator working out of Oakland. And together we're, um, we were gonna do a whole street theater festival in May that we canceled. Yeah. And we're following up with some artists to produce works now that are, I don't know what's happening where you are, but in the Bay Area, all our parks that are open are like city parks, Oakland, San Francisco are packed with people now. Yeah. because everyone's outside. So I want to start creating works that are not to bring people together to gather, but works that infiltrate spaces where people are already gathering. Sure. Or see work that people are already doing in those spaces and then give it um, financial and production support to expand how, right. how, those, how those spaces are impacted by art. So yeah, I'm outdoors. That's where to find me. Cool. Wherever um, I can be naked and outside, that's where I'll be. <laughs> Super. Well, thank you, Keith. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and we'll catch you soon, I hope. Yes, mutual. Hi okay. and bye, everybody. Everyone who tuned in that I know you, love you, and um, hope to see you outdoors. Yes. All right. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> Keith, you're breaking up. I don't know if this is happening for everyone. I assume it is. I is how about now me but i'm just i now hear talking about uh oh now can you hear me now hello um i can maybe, hear you can you you can't hear me hello hello maybe let's maybe let's i can other now seems okay this this is the wonders of our age okay so i sort of lost you beginning of this, this uh, Tantra How about now? Community story. So maybe if you go back. Now you're frozen again. Um, I wonder if this, this is my device. My device feels very, <laughs> um, hmm, I think, are you there? That's better. You were just gone for a minute and I was wondering if my device. I hear you. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? You go in and out. Hello? Are you there? Shucks. I hear you, but I can't. <laughs> I keep. Oh, yes. Now I hear you. Are you there? I'm here now. How about now? OK. Um, I feel like I want to try to start again on a Hello, everyone. Orlana Darkens Jury with the shot. I'm sorry, with KST <laughs> with Kelly Jayorn Theater. Um, I am just waiting for my interview. I am interviewing Jamal Woodson. He is the general manager of Women 100 and The Beat, as well as a serial entrepreneur. All right, he's on time. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Jamal is not letting me connect with you. So Jamal, for some reason, is not letting me connect with you. 
KST, do you have any um, recommendations? Oh, here we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was getting nervous. <laughs> I have to show you how to use technology. No, you didn't follow my instructions. I could I tell. Did. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you for joining me. I'm actually kind of like in between appointments. So okay. if we get if I disconnect or something because I'm in a sketchy area, I'll just hang up and reconnect. That sounds but, great. All right, cool. So welcome to Down with ODD. I'm Orlana Darkens Drury. I'm de the deputy director for Kelly Strayhorn Theater. And once a month, I connect with members in our community who's doing great things. And so today I'm talking to Jamal Woodson. He's the general manager of Whammo 100 and the Beat. Jamal, welcome to Down.